Thank you everybody for coming and welcome to our today CNDD CCNE uh, seminar se series. And it's a great pleasure to me to introduce our today's speaker. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gregory Lanza and his today talk on contact facilitated drug delivery of lipase liable prodrugs with targeted lipid based nanotherapies. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's indeed an honor to be invited to come to UNC, and I must say I've been impressed every, every moment of the day today. What I wanted to share with you is some of the work we do in drug delivering, but I can't help but show you some of the work we do. In, I did in imaging with our group because uh, it leads into the drug delivery, and it's where we started our work. And I wanted to point out this paper that was done uh, by Mark Bernarski and King Lee. It came out in 1998, Nature Medicine. And at this time, we were actually making uh, paramagnetic uh, nanoparticles for uh, imaging fibrin and thrombosis because I'm a cardiologist and that's what we do. Uh, and that's what we felt the unmet need was. But you see, fibrin has a very high density at its target. And this paper that was targeting the sparus alpha B beta 3 integrin actually changed my perspective and my colleague Sam Wickline's perspective of what molecular imaging might be able to do. And instead of uh, just thinking about uh, where we thought we had a tremendous amount of gadolinium being uh, sequestered at a site, we could actually envision being able to measure really uh, important biomarkers like the alpha beta 3 integrin. Now this particular study, I doubt that you really need to have imaging to tell that this rabbit and this tumor is, uh, is a large rabbit tumor here, or that uh, you have to normally wait 24 hours post-injection to see the signal. Uh, and so we thought we had a better way. And one of the particles that we were working, the particle we were working on at the time was a perfluorocarbon particle. It's about 250 nanometers. And it was functionalized as, as particles are functionalized now, although that wasn't very common in the 1990s. And uh, we were working in all modalities, and we put all kinds of chelates, whether it's nuclear or MR. We had different drugs, and I'll talk about that, and different targeting ligands. But for the moment, we'll talk a little bit about the integrin. So I'll skip ahead quite a few years. We published some other papers on integrin imaging. But to point out this uh, work, this is a, th a, a picture of about a 1.6 centimeter BX2 rabbit tumor in the back of the knee. So this is the back of the knee. And this is the T1 image. This is three Tesla. So this is a clinical scanner that you and I would get into for imaging. It's even high field for clinical imaging. And we targeted this agent. You could see that there was uh, enhancement around the rim. And you could see that the foot is down and there's even angiogenesis occurring uh, um, uh, towards the, the foot along the path of which water is flowing. But what was important, and one of the points we wanted to make when we did this work, was that if you do three-dimensional reconstruction and you uh, create a neovascular map, you get a whole different picture about angiogenesis and its role in, the, um, in situ. And this is important because, you know, people were thinking that from here, for instance, that angiogenesis is all around the tumor. Well, it wasn't. And that angiogenesis is uh, almost inside and out, and it isn't. So you can see that it's asymmetrically distributed, each one of these blue voxels representing a neovascular rich voxel. And you can see that if you take a biopsy from one place, you might get one answer. You take a biopsy from another. Another major part that we wanted to show that came out, we published it late, but it was uh, done some time ago, was uh, that it's important if you're doing molecular imaging or targeting in general that you're quantitative. It was so many people were seeing, oh, here we see angiogenesis, or here we see some response, but it's a low-resolution picture, and you don't know what it is, and you can't get the same response time and time again. It's very important as a physician that you give me a number. So the angiogenesis level, the neovascular level was a 10 today, and then three days later we do it again, it's a 12 or it's an 8. You know, so that I know whether if we're trying to treat this, whether we're moving up or down. So this is an example of one individual animal at eight days. So you can see that MR, even with the contrast agent, doesn't have the sensitivity to see angiogenesis when it first begins. But as it riches, you can see this uh, tumor, same rabbit, 
uh, immune state day 14, another injection, and then this injection right here, two days later, and you can see they match. And these images are made two hours after injection. So you can, you can quantify the map. We actually took that agent to the clinic. It was done in Australia. And one of the problems we had with that particular particle was that we induced uh, acute complement activation, even though in all the species we tested, which included um, two rodents, rabbits, and monkeys, we, and dogs, we didn't really have any significant findings um, to preclude us from going to the clinic. But people talk, and at low dose, we actually, they started to say, oh, my back hurts. And we later found this out to be acute complement activation. This is using a lysis assay. This is using an ELISA. But you can see here that you have C3A splitting. Or in this case, you've exhausted the, the complement. And so uh, before, when you put the particles in with the blood, so that when you add in uh, red blood cells uh, that have an antibody, there's no complement to bind them and lyse the cells. So therefore, you end up having a lot of lysis here and a high signal, a lot less here, and that's reflective of um, complement. Uh, the important thing is, at the time we did this study in the clinic, we really weren't thinking about acute complement activation. And what's interesting is the, it's the GAD DOTA PFC particle, the PFC nanoparticle itself has no complement activation. So I'm not going to go down. We actually made other particles based on manganese and gadolinium. We resolved all the complement stuff, and we learned a lot in the path. But the other thing I wanted to share with you, that the core of this particular particle was rich, rich in fluorine. So really, at the time, it became obvious to us that you could see the same type of thing we wanted to see with uh, the gadolinium, which you see right here. Here's the gadolinium. We could see it with fluorine imaging. And by putting the two things together, we could actually have the proton image and the fluorine image. But the thing about um, doing this is the, the ability to image fluorine by MRI is a lot slower than the ability to image the proton. And, and there's very little fluorine to be seen. So there are a lot of problems. And one of them was motion. But we're using what was developed, which was a dual capability image, protons and fluorine simultaneously by this scanner using dual transmit and receive coils, we actually were able to compensate. So let me just point out here. Here are uh, some phantoms. This is nanoparticles at four nanomolars. This is, if you have the raw image and you took it of this, you would see that you would have blurring. So the quantitative values you would have, the image you have is blurred. The proton image is blurred. But if you use the proton image, which has a lot of signal, to adjust the, for the motion and compensate, you can compensate the fluorine because both lines of case space were being drawn simultaneously from the fluorine and the proton um, uh, frequencies. And as a result, you can recover all of this. So, Fluorine became even better than the gadolinium in the sense that it's quantitative. In fact, because we had the ability to do proton and fluorine, we were actually able to map the B1 field. That's the antenna sitting here and, and what its sensitivity is to signals farther in its field. The bottom line is if the cancer is sitting over here, I'll get a low signal and I'll quantify it as less cancer. But if the cancer is sitting right here next to the antenna, I'll get a high signal. It's the same as your radio, OK? And, and so what we can do, though, because we have simultaneously collecting both, we take the proton image, we map its sensitivity pattern, and then we can correct the fluorine image. So we can, we can be quantitative. And you can know whether you're talking about 50 millimolar, 20 millimolar, whatever the quantitation is, wherever the, the cancer is. <clears throat> it was picked up and now being uh, studied by other people. I just wanted to point out fluorine imaging here from, the, from this group, which is Gervais. They were doing it in brain, and this is the first example of angiogenesis imaging the brain with fluorine. And this group in uh, Germany, uh, Flogel, uh, they were also doing it, in this case, for fiber and thrombus, as we did. And they made a, um, a thrombus. But both of those imaging were at high-field uh, animal scanners. 
This one here, for instance, 9.4, the one previously, 7 Tesla. But I wanted to share this with you for my molecular imaging and a little bit about theranostic therapy. The bottom line is the lungs, unless you're talking about cancer, if you're talking about interstitial disease, if you're talking about inflammatory disease, asthma, pulmonary hypertension, molecular imaging in the lungs is very challenging. We can't use ultrasound because of the air. CT is very insensitive. Uh, we see asthma changes, COPD changes. These are late manifestations. And the drugs that we're using now are becoming very, very expensive. In the case of asthma, um, we were just using steroids. Now we have personal, many, many more personalized medicines that cost six, $8,000 a month for months and months and months. Plus, there's also the other issue is that uh, those you have no idea of how effective you are because the only feedback we really have is how well you blow. Your pulmonary function test, which is a gross manifestation of the lung activity throughout your lung, and we want it to be more spatial. So I just wanted to point out that we worked on a, a dust mite model, and there were other papers validating all this stuff, but essentially we, they inhale dust mites, which are common in your beds, and, and uh, it generates asthma as a trigger. And if that generates angiogenesis in the upper airways, and that's seen here with fluorine molecular imaging at three tesla on a rat. So that's a big bore, 60 centimeters, with a little guy sitting in the middle. Okay. We used the targeted therapy in this case that was a mice cell, and it was targeted with a prodrug of doxetaxel or fumagillin, which I'm going to get into. But you can see that we totally reduce the amount of... Um, of angiogenesis, as you can see here, it's much lower, and we markedly reduce the airway hyperreactivity. So from a clinician standpoint, what you really want to do with a patient with moderate disease is you want to be able to treat them and know you treated them. And you want to be able to have a number to put on that. And MRI imaging uh, offers that. It offers high resolution in a non-ionizing radiation that you can give to kids and you can give to adults many times in their life. So I talked a little bit about drug delivery, and I wanted to share our, uh, uh, our view about it and what we, how we approached it uh, for the rest of the talk. Now, most people talk about drug delivery. They talk about, in, particularly in particles, they're talking about putting drugs in particles, taking them to cells, and, or either putting them in a particle as an excipient, like a Braxane, or taking them targeted or delivering passively or targeted to a cell, and then having the particle in the cell and release. Or sometimes disrupting it around the cell, and hopefully the drug goes in. So from the very beginning, our approach was to put the drug in the outer layer of the cell. And this is a phospholipid layer, and this is the fluorocarbon in this particular case, but it could be the mice cell. And the idea is that we were not going to pegylate the surface. And what happens is, is when these two lipid surfaces come together, this, this surface and this, they'll fuse. And when they fuse, the drug will go from here to here. This is an example using a rhodamine labeled particle and a C32. The green are these uh, endosomal markers. But you can see that the lipid is fusing from here onto and over the surface of the uh, cell. This is a picture, actually, of that hum uh, SEM of that process. This is the particle, a PFC particle, with its lipid membrane collapsing as it creates a hemifusion complex. And this delivery from here to here is actually doesn't require ATP. It'll happen in the cold. But this is an ATP requiring step. So the drugs that are put here, whether they're the prodrugs or just so, uh, lipid soluble drugs, will go from here directly to the outer leaflet. And then they can pass to the inner leaflet, which is continuous with all the leaflets in the um, cell except the mitochondria. Now, we had been using fumagillin because it was very hydrophobic, but other drugs like Paclitax and others wouldn't stay in the particle. But fumagillin did, and even the regular fumagillin, um, which had been used as TMP470 clinically, um, was much more effective than this particle. So if you gave TMP470 uh, for a... Um, uh, in the clinic, you ended up having, uh, you couldn't give the doses you gave to animals, and you had neurocognitive side effects. 
at the doses it gave, and only some anecdotal success. This, this, uh, this is a methionine aminopeptidase inhibitor that um, is very specific for angiogenesis, so we were interested in trying to use it. It doesn't have cross-reactivity with other cells off-target. So we were able to drop, just by putting fumagillin here at about 2 mole percent in the lipid membrane, the dose was 10,000-fold less, and we were able to have significant effect on tumor angiogenesis, as I show you here, and as you can see by MRI. And we, we were getting ready to move towards the clinic with this as a theranostic, if you will. But the problem was that when we did dissolution studies on the bench, the fumagillin um, stayed in the particle pretty well, as I show you here. You can see as a percent, very little of it came out, and then kind of nothing. So you lose maybe 5 6%, the rest of it stays in. But when we did it, Tracking the homing ligand, the ABB homing ligand, I'll tell you about in a minute, uh, the gadolinium, the drug, the PFC, and tracking the pharmacokinetics of all of those as percent of the injected drug, which should be similar, they weren't. And the fumagillin was out very quickly, and some of the other drugs like Taxane were instantly. So we knew now that we were only delivering to get that effect a small percentage of what it was. And we worked around trying to figure out how to go about solving that problem. And that would take a whole hour to tell you all our failures. But essentially, those failures mostly came from trying to put the drug on the outside of the particle connected here from the phospholipid. Didn't matter what the coupling, what was labeled to. It, it just never generated much drug on the inside. So that led us to putting the drug on the inside here at this SN2 lipid. And uh, we put it here just as shown here for fumagillin. Now, fumagillin is photosensitive. It has a conjugated double bond system. So we got rid of the conjugated double bond system, and this is actually fumagillinol. And what we have is this ester, and then we have this uh, acyl group and this phospholipid. And the phospholipid puts the drug into the hydrophobic region. And then when these two cells bind, as I showed you on the SEM, the drug moves from the lip, lipid layer, outer lipid layer, into the outer cell membrane layer. Then it can come into the inner membrane layer, transfer, transfer into that. And there are many, many, many different enzymes that can lipase off the, uh, the SN2 lipid. In fact, uh, they don't even have to be lipases. There's probably others, other enzymes. The, the one thing that we don't know uh, what the controlling mechanism is, and I'll just share our speculation for whatever it's worth, is it may even be surveillance of the lipid membrane, that you put a big bulky group in there and the cells go, what is this doing here, and takes that lipid out. There's some evidence for it, but it's never been proven. So this is what we call a lipase li labile prodrug. And we thought we had been really pretty clever, I have to admit. I thought it was very clever. And then I started looking more in the literature and more in the literature, and I said, uh-oh, other people thought about this. <laughs> and the first stuff I found were these people who had done um, some work in trying to put prodrugs of indomethacin and valproate, anti-inflammatory and anti-seizure. And they were, they were trying to do it by um, oral delivery, total bust. The prodrugs and everything they did was even worse than giving the straight drug. And then they put it in a liposome, thinking that that might be better, and that was even worse. So this, this I learned a lot about what they had done and they, how they made their prodrugs, but fundamentally, this was not a very good approach. But I said, well, you know, they're talking about uh, maybe they just didn't have the right formulation. And later I found this work that was done by, from the lab of Andresen, who did his PhD actually on this topic. And he also uh, formed a small company that failed later. And it was um, an outstanding series of papers, and these are just some of them, that actually explored the uh, phospholipids. And they were trying to put the phospholipid prodrug in a liposome. And the idea was it'll go to the tumor, and then it will be disrupted by the excess excre excretion of lipases by the tumor. And therefore, you'll have a local um, uh, delivery by having more free release of the drug you wanted there. Well, that never happened. And when it all boiled down, without going through all the different um, things, it turns out that when you use these synthetic lipids in a liposome, 
If you don't pegylate the liposome, it is stable. In fact, in our emulsion, you can add, you can put the emulsion in blood, you can put the emulsion in serum, you can spike it with lipases that we published, and, it, and the prodrug is stable. The drug doesn't come out, and it doesn't go into red cells or other things when it gets bumping on those, unless you're delivered and stuck there. But while the emulsion didn't need to have pegylation to survive long enough for its purpose, the liposomes did. And the liposome peg actually acted like a wick for water. The water gets into the membrane, and so does the enzyme, and they get destroyed. So when you had to make, you had to pegylate the liposome to be stable, but pegylation destroyed the phospholipase because it, it reduced its protection. And the alternative might be to cross-link the lipids, but that makes it impossible for them to have the free exchange. So really, what, what's, um, what's going on is that we're making drugs, we're putting them into lipid particles, whether they're big ones or little ones, and we're protecting the drug all the way to its target. And when the particles bind, what we call, con or at least I call, contact-facilitated drug delivery, the lipids themselves move to the target cell. And with it goes the drug. Now, that, that system is kind of like a kiss of death. In other words, the drug didn't have to go into the target cell, get into the end zone, have some way of getting out and uh, having its effect. And that was important to me at the time, having purified things and proteins and stuff, because it's just, to me, another law step. So I wanted to have the effect as soon as I could get there, because I felt if just getting there is enough, it's hard enough. And that's why we went down this path, actually. Now, I reviewed this recently, and uh, I just pointed out you can get it on wires. It's, uh, this particular one, wires isn't in general, but this paper is open access for you. So we made it first with uh, doxorubicin. And why? Because I could see it, right? And you can see it here, and it's true by confocal, too, that um, the phospholipids are actually in all the membranes. So if you give doxorubicin um, targeted particles to these cells, which are um, 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 endothelial cells, activated endothelial cells, the particles will bind, the drug will go in. Some of the doxorubicin you can see is already in the nucleus. Some of it here with the prodrug is in the membranes. Here, and this is like uh, one hour after treatment, and here is the um, uh, doxorubicin free. You can see none of it, it goes right through the cell membrane, right into the cell cytosol, right into the nucleus directly. So there's a difference in the pharmacology, intracellular, if you will, of using a prodrug versus a free drug. But in our case, what we were really looking for is that the prodrug wasn't deactivated. In our effort to put it on there, we didn't kill it, because we've killed other things, and this you can see at least as active as the free. Now, I wanted to point out that uh, something about homing. I showed you it by MRI. A lot of people use cyclic RGD peptides, but we did not do that. We use an activated, uh, a peptidomimetic to the activated uh, ABB3. It has a binding affinity of about 5 to 10 nanomolars to the activated form, and that's 15 to 20 times to the non-activated form. And you can see it's on a spacer. This is the one we used in the lab. It's not the one we took to the clinic. And then it's on a, um, a, a, a peg spacer on the surface. So that PFC particle I was telling you about had 50 picomolar binding. That's stick and stay. That's what that is. That's about two or 300 uh, homing ligands on a 250 nanometer particle. Okay, so the question is, we wanted to know what is it actually sticking to and be able to show people. So using this matrigel plug model, we, we look, looked at it, and we, we um, looked at angiogenesis after targeting particles. And this matrigel plug model was done in a, um, in a um, mouse model that was, um, had, uh, it, it was a uh, tie, um, what do I want to say? It had, it had been uh, modified so that it expressed uh, uh, a TIE2 promoter. 
And so what we have here is the red particles here on the top coming from over here. And you can see the rhodamine particles binding angiogenesis all the way around. You can see that PCAM co-associates here. It's ripped off there. But you can see this and this line up exactly. And there's no type 2 positive uh, uh, cells in this area. Because Ti2, even though people were using it for angiogenesis, is actually a marker when the tubule actually forms, when you actually get a tubule, not when you have a sprout. And you can see here, in this part, right next to it, that there's no angiogenesis. You see there's no, um, uh, even though there's a lot of neovascular uh, uh, vascular binding, and there's a lot of Ti2. So we actually bind to alpha V beta 3 positive endothelial cells that are Ti2 negative. PCAM positive. And I just wanted to point out that using a similar project here with the Matrigel, we're in a situation where we're using a particle that we made for photoacoustic contrast. And you can see that the, the baseline contrast, which is a technique where it's light in, sound out, you can see it binds, to, it, it sees red blood cells. So the red blood cells uh, absorb the light, generate heat, which creates an acoustic wave. And that's just detected with a standard ultrasound detector. And so you can see the, um, the red blood cells in this expanding vasculature. But after the contrast agent, look what you see that you didn't see, all these sprouts from the particles binding within these sprouts. And notice that they aren't connected, and they weren't seen here. Why? There are no red blood cells, or very few red blood cells in there to be seen. There's no blood flow. So I'll just skip the target in the competition study and go to the Fumagillin Pro drug that we made. And you can see at baseline, you have this tubule. You don't really see any sprouts. And then after treatment, you don't see any sprouts. But you still see this baseline tubule. The point is, is the treatment that we we're talking about is only against the sprouts, the very nascent angiogenesis. And that's the term I use when I say angiogenesis. And we've shown it specifically for what it is and what we stick to and how we map it and how it's serial. And, and it's, this was important to us because we want to know what we do and take it to the clinic. And I hope it will be important to you to know exactly what it is you're doing. Now, we use it in this particular arthritis model, uh, which is a KRN injection model. And we were interested in what, um, um, what the benefit of anti-angiogenesis would be in rheumatoid arthritis. You can see the particles, the rhodamine particles, are binding in the arthritic paw, not in the normal. In the targeted paw, the non-targeted particles don't, and the targeted particles don't bind in the normal. And I just wanted to point out a couple things. One is that the fumagillin, just putting it in the membrane, which worked in cancer, which worked in atherosclerosis, which worked to some extent in, um, in, um, in this model too, to a very good extent, actually had a very good response. So we gave repeated treatments, and this is the normal PAR, this is the arthritic PAR that was treated, and this is the non-arthritic PAR. And I think it doesn't take a, a rocket science to see that this is highly inflamed, this is far less inflamed, and this is normal. So it's a big deal. And if you measure the angiogenic index, which we did, um, you can, which is just a function of the, number, the signal times the number of, um, of, of uh, pixels, you can, you can get an estimate. You can see that we suppressed it. And we expected to. We didn't expect this much response. So we continued doing this, and I just skip ahead to a, a, a later paper where we looked at the inflammatory arthritis, but now with the prodrug. And what we got was more clinical inflammation, paw thickness, arthritic score. You can see it going up and up. But with the Fumagillin Pro drug, it was flattening out. The thing that was uh, impressive to us, though, about it, we expected to knock out blood vessels. We expected it to change oxygenation. What we didn't expect it to do was be anti-inflammatory. But if you look at all the, the local markers of, of inflammation within the joint, they were all tremendously suppressed. And we asked ourselves, well, what, how does this happen? Now, this is a long, uh, there are many, many experiments here, so I'm just going to give you the summary. But essentially what happens is that angiogenesis 
is both anti-angiogenesis, the way we're going to practice it, and I'm going to tell you, is both anti-angiogenesis and anti-inflammatory. In this picture, this is a particle. This is an endothelial cell. This is a macrophage, okay? We're targeting directly to the endothelial cell, and you saw we eliminated it. That's a big difference between anti-BEGF, anything. All right, where you're trying to absorb it out. We go, it's like on, um, I always talk to people like Raiders of the Lost Ark, and the guy has the sword and the sword, and the, and, um, the um, uh, Harrison Ford has the gun, and he just shoots him. You know, that's our approach to anti angiogenesis. Don't mess around, just get rid of it. Well, we know, we know that macrophages stimulate angiogenesis, right? So this pathway was known. But what we found out is the fumagillin actually led to, and I won't go through all this mechanism, but an increase in NO that was associated with the apoptosis in the endothelial cell. An NO or an NO derivative is coming back and feeding back to the macrophage. And the macrophage has an increase in autophagy, autophagy flux, that ends up leading to a decrease in NF-kappa B and a marked decrease in inflammatory cytokines. So for the first time, we realized <clears throat> that the approach we were using for anti-angiogenesis was generating a back-channel um, answer, uh, back-channel signal to the macrophages, which is similar to what we were talking about today, Leaf, except you had a different mediator. But we were talking backwards. So the cell that was stimulated, when the stimulus is off, was getting a signal. In this case, it's a chemical signal. It could even be that it's dependent on that signal to keep its activity. But it's, it's, a, it's an example of the balance in, uh, in, in cell biology. So I showed you the result in asthma, right? So yes, it was anti-angiogenic, but asthma is an inflammatory disease. Now, the fumagillin has no effect on a macrophage, but it could, it, it could be feeding back here. And the paclitaxel particles we used could actually have targeted macrophages and, and led to um, a reduction also in uh, inflammatory cytokines. So there's, there's, a, um, there's more to angiogenesis than meets the eye. <clears throat> One of the other drugs that we were working on because what the company we had formed was interested in it was paclitaxel. They're all interested in paclitaxel. And um, we made the prodrug of paclitaxel, and we did these studies where we exposed uh, the cells for an hour, and we always use brief exposures rather than 24 hours in general. And the reason for it is, in, in practice, the cells in targeting in vivo are only going to see this drug for a short time. So we want to deal with the reality of that situation, not swim, put them in a swimming pool and see what will kill them. So you can see we measured it out at 24, 48, 72, and you can see at higher doses, they're basically all the same, whether you give the free drug, the pro drug, paclitaxel, doxetaxel. Going back to that KRN model, I just pulled this out, and it was much more potent than fumagillin using paclitaxel. I mean, it was like blockbusters, and it just ended the clinical disease immediately. And in angiogenesis, it was anti-angiogenesis in the BX2 rabbit tumor as well most of it, again, in the rim, as opposed to the center of the, of the tumor. So the, the prodrug was working. Now, I talked to you about the PFC particles, and we're going to continue to use those a little bit in another talk, another uh, example. But I wanted to tell you that we generated these micelles. They're really around 12, 15 nanometers. They're a mixed micelle. And um, we were able to put the prodrugs into the membranes of these, just the same as we did the others. And we again used, in this case, the same homing ligand. We don't always use that one, but we did. And we compared them. So we have a, a micelle that's small and a PFC particle that's vascular constrained. Now, I just wanted to share, I'm not going to go through this experiment. Uh, it involves a doxotaxel prodrug. But this is a, a metastatic disseminated tumor in a mouse. It's a PYMT tumor line, and the, we're interested in, in metastases and bone-related cancers. And so this, this is a solid tumor, and you can see that the micelle has gone in and bound all throughout this tumor directly. Here's the non-targeted, here are the uh, non-targeted, and here's the integrin in a, in a normal bone. 
the, the, it's a, it has amazed me how this little mice cell can actually penetrate out and get out to, uh, directly into the middle of these tumors, not really even very heterogeneously. And in this particular study, just to give you a bottom line on activity, is you can see that the prodrug actually reduced the BLI, as you can see here, versus the free drug versus saline. Also reduced, as you can see, the metastatic tumor area, and also markedly reduced um, bone osteolytic destruction, which is represented as these black areas. Here, right? So you, there's no bone, no X-ray signal. I show you this just to, to, give, to give you the point that the particle can actually deliver this particular drug, for example, or any prodrug for that matter, into solid tumors, into places that normally we think we get hung up in the rim. Okay. Now I'm sure that depends on the stromal density too. But this was uh, disseminated, where all the tumor cells were put in the heart, circulated all over the body, and metastasized, or uh, settled there. So it's not uh, like we injected it there. So the CMMN, that we get to be part of the CCNE once again, we were in the first cycle, missed it the second, now the third, is actually involved in multiple myeloma. And one of the projects is my project that I do with Mike Thomason. And we had started working on um, whether we could use, uh, deal with uh, multiple myeloma in a, in a very different way than other people. And for those who are not familiar with multiple myeloma, it's a B-cell disease, part of the immune system, that you, it, when you activate B-cells by some antigen, it forms plasma cells. Plasma cells produce a lot of antibodies. And when you start over, when those plasma cells become cancerous, they're called plasma cytomas. And when you have a bunch of them, it's called multiple myeloma. And you can see it affects a lot of things. You get bone lesions, you get anemia because it packs the marrow, you have renal failure from the overproduction of antibody, you have hypercalcemia from the bones that are being degraded, you have you know, tremendous susceptibility, they all get infections. You have uh, amyloid, I see it a lot in the heart where the walls of your heart are very, very thick from the depositing of the amyloid um, antibodies in the, in the wall, just super thick and won't relax. Uh, of course, the drugs we use aren't even that good. You, you have a choice of being treated or having peripheral neuropathies. And of course, it affects the central nervous system in half the people. So multiple myeloma is a problem. The initial treatment is pretty good, actually. But inevitably, you're dead in five to 10 years because it almost always comes back and kills you. It's not a good diagnosis. In the 19, late 1990s and 2000, in cancer, one of the major uh, thrusts was to go after CMIC, the holy grail. It's a promoter. It, it actually normally in, interacts with MAD and MAX, and I'm not going to go through all of that. But to make a long story short, it interacts in the DNA, CMIC, probably 12 to 20,000 places. It's a major regulatory of cell growth. The thing is, is they, CMIC is a, an oncogene, is, a, is, is very potent, and it wasn't druggable. It had two reasons for that. One is, as a transcription factor, it was an amorphous protein. And it's forming a dimer with another transcription factor, these are HZIP proteins, that's an amorphous protein. So it's this blob and this blob, which is a big difference between an enzyme that has a hydrophobic catalytic cleft that you can find, or receptor that has some structure. It's like this blob and this blob. And it wasn't until they realized that when these two blobs come together, they have a couple points. They're called ID points. They may have three or four, where they actually makes the proteins become rigid and allows the dimerization to form. So for a long time, people tried to disrupt this dimerization. And, then, and one of the uh, leaders in the area, he's a member of our team, is Dr. Ed Prochownik. He's from uh, uh, Children's Hospital in, um, in uh, uh, Cleveland, I think, Cincinnati. And making a long story short, he came up with small molecules. Now think about how this is. This is a big protein, a big protein. And what he was coming up with small molecules, a few hundred molecular weight, that if it were placed in the right place, would disturb 
the binding. So in this figure, you have CMYK and MAX. They have to come together. They come together and they actually form a scissor-like uh, complex that binds to an E-box in a certain place in DNA, and that triggers cell proliferation, all the genes down the line. And in many cases, like multiple myeloma, Burkitt's lymphoma, AML, ALL, these cells become addicted to that stimulus. It's called MYC addiction. They need it. So if you can disrupt CMYC uh, stimulation at the DNA level, then you can go ahead and you can break the addiction and the cell will go to apoptosis. So what do these small molecules do? Well, it binds, as I mentioned, to the MYC inhibitor. And what happens is it changes or disrupts the conformation of the dimer. So it either doesn't dimerize, or more likely it has a distorted dimerization, and that dimer doesn't bind into DNA properly. And so the, the cell dies in phase G0, G1. Okay, so just to repeat, now in our case, we're going for alpha 4 beta 1 in this case, but we're using a BLA4 homing ligand. We have a micelle. We also use the bigger particles, but we have a micelle that's about 15 nanometers that has the CMYC prodrug, as I'll show you in a moment. And it's going to bind to the multiple myeloma cell, and then the drug is going to transfer into the inter inter membranes, and it's going to be liberated by lipases, and then those are going to uh, disrupt the binding of MYC and MAC, and MYC and MAC aren't going to be able to bind to DNA. That's the mechanism. This is the prodrug. This is the small molecule right here. It's binding to PACPC, PAZPC, right here. And this is, these are two human melanoma lines. This is a mouse. And one of the things you see right off, this is just putting the prodrug in and the free drug in as DMSO in the cell culture. So it's not a function of receptor numbers or anything. It's the actual drug activity. You see the prodrugs have much, much more activity than the free drug. And the reason is not because the drug itself is any more active. It's because the bioavailability of the phospholipid to the cell membrane is much more active than the bioavailability to get into cells of the free drug. So one of the advantages of the pro-drug approach is that when it gets there and does this fusion, that, that molecule wants to be there. That's home. That's where its brothers and cousins are. Now, I just, I won't spend a lot of time going through all these. Let me just go down to here. If you give the free drug or the pro-drug as its lipid and you inject that right in blood, you'll end up with nothing. The free drug will be destroyed. The pro-drug will be destroyed. If you give the pro-drug and you target it with BLA4, this is the survival of the controls. Here's the survival of those. And this is the first generation pro-drug that was used. We used it because it's well documented. And in the CMNN now, what we're testing is our second and third generation drugs that are far superior to this one. So we have high hopes. But that's the, the concept. What we're talking about is we're taking a drug that if you gave it systemically in blood, normally would be destroyed, just like this. Have no effect, no matter what the dose, unless you really overdose it. And even what got there didn't, when it got to the cell, wasn't able to get in the cell to have the intracellular bioactivity we hoped for. So basically a poor pharmaceutical, even though the activity of it in cell-free EMS assay is superior, highly potent. So how do you get a drug like that there? Well, in our case, we made the pro-drug. We incorporated it into a micelle, in this case, because we're going extravascular. We kept it protected all the way because the micelle is also not pegylated. It goes all the way, just like I showed you in the solid bone, right into the tumors. And it's, it can bind, in this case, to BLA4. And when it binds, it's very, like, it's less than five minutes. And if you're, well, that's all we know because we've never cracked it any faster. But in five minutes, you can see the drug is already in the membranes, already cycling. And, in, and some things like Dr. Rubison, it's already starting to appear in the nucleus. So it goes very quickly. Now, there's a storage of it, and I think that may even play a role. I showed you the doxorubicin. It's not like it just goes completely over. I think there may even be a prolonged release 
element to it because the cells will upregulate CMYK in response. So you have to have continual stimulus to keep it down. And I think we're partially getting our benefit from achieving that. Otherwise, we just have a transient effect. But this is uh, the plan, and this is where I think um, this approach to drug delivery has a lot of merit. And the other thing I'll point out about CMYK, this drug has almost no off-target effects unless you have an activated cell that's MYK-dependent. So in summary, I've just talked to you briefly about what we've been doing and why we were excited and how we happen to have to get to phospholipase uh, label prodrugs. Uh, they stabilize drugs like fumagillin, like the CMYK. They're essentially protected from all the, the uh, milieu around them. They uh, don't have premature release in circulation. So you, like in the case of the fumagillin, we dropped the dose down eightfold from what I used of the regular drug to do the work I showed you in arthritis. And the drug is liberated once it hits the cell and circulates into the intracellular membranes, and, uh, it, uh, and it becomes bioavailable very soon. I, I don't think it's 100% bioavailable. I think it continues. I don't know if it all comes out over time or what. We haven't ever had enough money or the, the right um, opportunity to look at that. I've asked for it before, but I never got it. And uh, otherwise, uh, it's, a, it's a very unique way. And this is really what we try to do in drug delivery in general. We try to take drugs that are bad, bad actors, that are really potent, and we try to make them, through our work, collectively useful. And this is an example of how we tried to make this useful. So I just want to point out uh, some of the people at C-Train who are around for this. We have many, many collaborators, uh, including Mike Thomason, who's part of the C CCNE, with myself and also Dr. Sam Achalave, who is our principal investigator for the C CCNE at WashU, and, and many, many people and generous funding. Thank you. <laughs>